Okay, Baruch Hashem. We're going to get ready for Pesach with a Pesach Mimer. This Mimer is called Matzazu. This Matzah. Where, where are those words from? Matzazu. This Matzah. From the Haggadah, right. So in the Haggadah we say Matzazu. This Matzah. And then we're actually supposed to uh, do different customs. Whether you uncover the Matzah or you raise the Matzah. But the point is there's props. There's, the saying is always exciting because it's like one of those rare occasions where we inherently have show and tell. That's like in fact, the whole discussion of, um, in the Haggadah, when it says, Yochum Resh you might think that we should say the Haggadah Resh because it's connected to the Gula, and then we conclude, no, we have to do it, we can't even do, we can't do it Resh we can't even do it uh, on the day of the Exodus, we have to do it at the night when we have the matzah in front of us, because we need props. Okay, so we literally say matzah zu, this matzah, right here, see this, see this kids? This matzah. All right. So that's what it's called. Matzah zu. Mamer from the Rebbe. Or liyud dalad nissen. Tav shemem tes. Okay. Matzah zu. Let's jump in. Matzah zu. This matzah sha'anu eichlim that we eat. Al shuma. For what? For what reason do we eat it? This is all a quote from the Haggadah. Al shum shalai hispik batzekes shal aveseinu. Because the bread or the... Dough of our ancestors did, did not manage lahachmitz to rise. Before the King of all kings, the Holy and Blessed Be He, revealed Himself and, re- and redeemed them. They didn't even have time for their bread to rise. They would have had their bread rise. Everyone, any normal person lets their bread rise. But Hashem just revealed himself and took them out of Egypt before they could even allow the bread to finish rising. That's what we read in the Haggadah. Okay, fine. Now the Rebbe says, it is explained in the Drushim, that means the Maimorim, the discourses of the Rebbeim. Meaning, this is a concept that is visited by the Rebbeim and analyzed, and this is not a new thing to ponder. The Rebbe is going to convey to us the upshot of this subject. Okay, so it's <coughs> explained in the Maimorim of the Rebbeim. This that the Haggadah says the reason why we eat matzah, unleavened bread, is because their dough, our, our ancestors' dough, didn't have time to rise. Even though, technically, if you look, the commandment to eat matzah was issued earlier. They were under uh, the obligation. They were bound by a commandment already to eat matzah. So what are you saying? It was just a practical thing that we ended up eating matzah because we didn't have time for the bread to rise. No, no, no. They were under the obligation to eat matzah. They were already under that obligation. But so this explains the reason why the Haggadah gives that explanation rather than Another explanation that they that they did it because it was a mitzvah, not because it was just a practical thing that happened. Key is because in the commandment where the commandment is stated to eat matzah, it says in the evening you shall eat matzahs. Okay, what what about it? Well, matzais choser vav. It says matzais mem tzadik sof. Not mem tzadik vav sof. It's written choser, which is not uncommon in Torah, that sometimes there will be a word that has a missing letter, especially a vav is one of the common letters that could be missing. And grammatically, you know it's there. And uh, you just read it as an unwritten vowel. I mean, there are no vowels in the actual Torah. So instead of having the vav there, you understand that, it, that, that it's a choylem, and you read it matzois, and there's no vav. Okay. Matzois choser vav. Matzois without a vav. 
ובפוסק ויפו אס הבוצק אשר הציעו ממצרים וגייס מצייס גמר. By contrast, in the verse where it describes what they did, what's the difference between a prescriptive statement and a, de- and a descriptive statement? Right? A prescription, you go to the doctor and he gives you a prescription. So pre- prescriptive means it's telling you what you ought to do. Here are the instructions. Here is what is good. Do this. Descriptive is, I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying it's the fact. This is what it is. Sometimes people get upset, by the way, when you make descriptive statements. And they say, well, that's terrible. Well, I'm just telling you the truth. I'm just reporting. I don't make the news. I just report it, right? So... Bo'erif Teichlu Matzais is a descriptive or prescriptive statement? Pre. Prescriptive statement. And it has the Vav or it doesn't have the Vav? No Vav. No Vav. Okay, good. And then you have the Posik, Ve'yefu Asabotzak Ashahitzium in Mitzrayim Uges Matzais Gomer. They baked cakes of matzah from the dough that they had brought out of Egypt. That's prescriptive or descriptive? Descriptive. In fact, it, it's in past tense. It's pretty clear. It's talking about something that happened. This is what happened. You don't like it? This is what happened. All right. Ksiv matzois male vav. And there the matzois has its vav. It has a vav. Okay. I don't know what any of this means. I just know we have two verses with matzois. One is prescriptive. One is descriptive. One has no vav. And one has a vav. Datsivu yalachilas matzahu kedem chatzais. The commandment to eat matzais was before midnight. What does it mean before midnight? It was given before midnight? Well, yeah, it was. But not only it was given before midnight, it means it was to be fulfilled before midnight. Meaning on the night of the first Pesach. Like what we would call Seder night. The real Seder night. They had the actual Korban Pesach. And it was the first Seder night. And they all did it in their homes. And, uh, you know, the blood on the door, that whole thing. All right, so that has to be before midnight. Now, since before midnight, <clears throat> they were still in Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim doesn't just mean the place where they were slaves, but Mitzrayim is the archetypical concept of enslavement, Mitzrayim. Boundaries, limitations, constrictions. Before the King of All Kings, the Holy One Blessed Be, He revealed Himself to them. So they're in Mitzrayim before God revealed Himself to them and redeemed them. So they're in a spiritually still somewhat low place. That's why matzois in that instance is written without a vav. In other words, it indicates a lower level of matzois. A vav is, well, you know, the letters are not just um, cute symbols. Every, yeah, it says in Shari Yechud Vamuna from the Alter Rebbe that the letters, the Hebrew letters, are actually maps. They describe the, or they metaphorically, symbolically describe the best you can, on a <laughs> two-dimensionally, uh, the, the energy path of the different letters. You know, the different letters are building blocks of creation. <clears throat> so a vav is a pipeline. Literally. So the idea of a vav is something high being drawn down low. The matzois without a vav means that we don't have that. So this is pre-godly revelation matzois, therefore it's without a vav. By contrast, the descriptive verse where it says what happened, that they baked cakes of matzah from the dough they brought out of Egypt. Midaber, there it's speaking, Bahamatsa about the matzah, that they baked and indeed ate. 
after they left Mitzrayim. <coughs> it says that explicitly. It says, Es habatzak asher hoitziu mimitzrayim. The dough that they took out of Egypt. So they already took it out. They were already out. Shezeh hoya la'achrei chatzais. And that was after midnight. After the revelation. After redemption was already happening. After the King of all kings, the Holy One, blessed be He, revealed Himself to them and redeemed them. Therefore, in that verse, the word matzos is written with a vav to indicate the drawing down that that energy had become revealed and manifest in the world. That's also why, regarding the matzah eaten before midnight, it says, Ushmartem es hamatzais, you should guard the matzais. Why does it say you should guard the matzais? It needs to be guarded not to come to. Uh, fermentation, uh, what's it called? Uh, leavening. Blocked on the word leavening. Yeah. Um, chimutz. Does that mean that there's a vav? No, the, we're Does talking that? about the pre midnight matzah. Right, and it says, matzah. Okay, but it, yeah, in that verse there's a vav. But the matzah we're talking about pre midnight is pre redemptive matzah. <coughs> Therefore, you need to be told to per- particularly o- to watch over it, not to allow it to come to chimutz, meaning to say the default would be that it would come to chimutz, it would come to leavening, which we know represents ego, which represents Egypt, which is the idea of uh, the self-absorbed uh, megalomania, and uh, it's the antithesis of all spiritual growth. So that's what the leavening represents. So the pre-midnight, pre-redemptive matzah, you have to watch over it to guard it because the default would be that it would devolve into chimutz, into ego, if not for a special human intervention. Okay? All right. <clears throat> In contrast, the matzah that is after midnight, it says, They baked cakes of matzah from the dough because it had not risen. Just reporting the facts. It's because it had not risen. In other words, it's not special intervention. Watch that matzah. Watch that, I mean, watch that dough. Make sure it doesn't become puffy. No, it's just saying what happened. It didn't rise. It didn't rise. Shema atzma leibali dechimutz. In and of itself, it didn't rise. So we're now we're contrasting these two types of matzah. Pre midnight, post midnight. Pre midnight without avav. Post night with a, Post midnight with avav. Pre midnight, you need to watch it and guard it so nothing bad happens. After midnight. Nothing bad is going to happen. We're redeemed. Hashem revealed Himself. Nothing bad is happening. Okay. Ki ha matzah sha'achrei chatzais hi bechinas matzais malevav. Why? Because the matzah after midnight has that vav, which is hagiloi, the revelation, the nigla le melech machim lochem ekadosh baruch hu. Of Hashem revealing Himself, the King of all kings, the Holy and Blessed Behil, Volochin, and therefore, ain't Srich Shimur Mechimutz. It doesn't need to be guarded from Chimutz. When Hashem is revealed, the ego is not going to flare up. You have such godly revelation, there's no danger here of selfish thinking. It just, it's not going to happen. Before midnight, yeah, you're going to have to watch yourself, you're going to have to really be rigorous about it. After midnight, under those circumstances, it's just not going to happen. Not a concern. Not something that we have to worry about. All right. Vihine, how are we doing so far? So it's fairly straightforward so far, right? Okay. I made a bracha earlier for those watching online. 
והנה, חילוק זה שבין קודם חצי סור לאחרי חצי סור היו רק בפסח הראשי. Now this distinction that we are making between pre-midnight pre matzah and post-midnight matzah only existed that year, the first, the first Pesach. Lifnei matan Torah, which was before the giving of the Torah. As we all know, 49 days after the Exodus was the revelation at Sinai. So this is before the giving of the Torah. This is not the case after Matan Torah, meaning the eternal mitzvah, the eternal mitzvah that we keep. Even though we eat matzah before midnight, in fact, we have to endeavor to finish even the afikoim and the dessert before midnight. He bechinas matzahs malevav. We eat post midnight male vav matzah before midnight. The first time there was a distinction. There were two phases before midnight, after midnight. Chaser vav, male vav. Matzah that you have to watch to prevent it from becoming ego, and matzah that you don't have to watch because there's so much godly revelation that there's no concern that anything untoward would happen. But for the eternal mitzvah, the way we keep it, it's all on that level, which in the first year is post midnight. That's just what we eat before midnight. Sheesh bogam ho iloi, that in the matzah that we eat even before midnight, has within it the quality, the nigla le melchmachem lochim akurish barcho of Hashem having revealed himself to us in Egypt and taken us out of Egypt. Hmm? You're saying r the reality is, though, that it, it will rise if you don't watch. We do watch it. Yeah, we spend a lot of time and energy watching it. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Let's 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 find out. Let's find out. Okay. I I mean let's let's find out what's going on. Okay. Vizesha Kosov Bagoda Matsazu Shonu Echlam Al Shuma. This that the Hagoda says, Matsazu, this matza that we eat, why do we eat it? And we answer the question, Al Shum Shalo Hispikolo Lahachmit, because the dough of our ancestors didn't manage to rise. Meaning that on its own it didn't rise. Before Hashem, the Holy One, blessed be He, revealed Himself to them and redeemed them. So, When we describe the matzah, and we say, why are we eating the matzah? This matzah, right here, this matzah, we point to it. We say, you know why we, we eat it? Because the matzah couldn't even rise. Couldn't even rise. It wasn't even going to happen. It wasn't potential ego. It wasn't potential chametz. It just it was inherently matzah. That's what it was. Nobody was protecting it. Nobody was guarding it. That's just what happened. Okay. You're talking about, in the original story, a higher level that didn't transpire until a second phase, which we, we, we describe as the post-midnight phase. And yet, we're sitting there at our Seder, well before midnight, hopefully, pointing at the matzah and saying, this matzah right here that we're eating is because of the post-midnight matzah. It's a little bit funny. It's a little bit incongruous. You understand the, the discrepancy here? 
It's not a bombshell question. I don't think anybody's going to stay up at night panicked about this. But it's an interesting question. And if we allow that question to provoke our curiosity, we're going to discover some cool things about matzah and about Pesach in general. Okay? So, you got the question, we're sitting there, we're pointing to the prop, we're saying, this matzah, why do we eat it? We could have, you know, I'll ask you a question. What could have we said? Let's pretend we're writing the Haggadah right now. All right, at some point we know that we're going to, you know, uh, we, we know that you, you have to have Pesach uh, matzah motor at the, the Seder. So, you know, we don't have the Pesach because we don't have the Beis HaMikdash. Hashem, this year we will. But we have the mats and the mora, and we're supposed to point it out, make sure that we have it. Okay, here it is. So at some point, I'm going to point to the matzah. And maybe even because it's all for the kids, we know it's educational. The whole thing of the Seder is educational. So I'm going to say, this matzah, why do we eat it? <coughs> what would be a simple answer? To eat it before meals. Because they well, eat it. It's, it's a symbol of, <coughs> I got symbolic the sim- of what we I, I got the simplest answer. This matzah, why do we eat it? Simplest answer? Why do we really eat it? Hashem told, Hashem told us to eat it. it, says eat it. It's a commandment. It it? It's a commandment. We're eating it because it's a commandment. What's wrong with saying that? We're eating because it it's a commandment. Instead, what do we do? We say we're eating it because they ate it. Is that even true? I mean, is this just like family tradition? Is it like uh, historical reenactment? Like those guys dress up like Civil War uh, guys on, the, on Sunday and they go shoot cannons at each other? That's what it is, historical reenactment. We're eating it because it's, it's a mitzvah. It's an eternal mitzvah. But instead we say, no, no, no. We're eating it because their matzah didn't have time to rise. Okay, all right, you want to go down that path? But the matzah that didn't have time to rise wasn't before midnight. It was the next day when they were actually leaving. So, you know, get your facts straight. It seems like a lot of things are jumbled over here, and we're trying to straighten it out. Now, obviously, if you know a little bit of chassidus, you can tell we're on the cusp of a paradox. We're standing on the threshold of some type of paradox where we're going to, you guys all know where we're heading. We're, we're, instead of saying, well, it's incongruous and really we've got to sort it out and put this one here and put this one there, we are going to find that there's some type of transcendent view where we can be pre-midnight and post-midnight at the same time, sort of, kind of, yeah? Okay, but we're just trying to break that down in a way of Chabad, of Chochmah bin Adas, which is the style of of Chabad is to understand things intelligently. So we've, we've, got, we've got a question. We're curious. Why are we holding up the prop and we're saying that this matzah is a symbol or commemoration of post-midnight matzah, post-redemption matzah, but we're eating it pre-midnight. And we're very actually meticulous to do so, to finish it before midnight. Okay. That's the end of chapter one. All right. What do you say we do chapter two? All right. It's a short mimer. It's a very short mimer. I picked this mimer because I wanted something that we could finish before Pesach and be prepared for Pesach, God willing. Okay. Okay. V'yesh leimar. It's possible to explain so that Eva is now offering his own novel insight the matzah that we eat is maybe call it a third category. The matzah that we're eating is after matan Torah, after the commandment, the eternal commandment has been issued. And therefore, the matzah that we're eating is actually even greater than the post-midnight matzah of the first year. 
כי מכיוון שהגילוי דמלך מאכלים לא אוכלים הקדוש ברוך הוא בהמצה שונו איכלים לאחרים מתן תירו הוא על ידי קדימה שהוא עבדה בקיום התירו ומצווה במשך כל השונה קדם הפסח To explain what does that mean? It means that the revelation of the King of all kings, the Holy One, blessed be He, that's in the matzah that we're eating after Matan Torah, follows a year of doing mitzvahs. They didn't have that advantage. We are preparing for one Pesach since the last Pesach. So we're doing mitzvahs all year long, And by the time we get to Pesach, we are already primed. We're already prepared. They didn't have mitzvahs. They didn't have matan Torah. They didn't have matan Torah. So they didn't have the obligations, and therefore they did not have the nesinus koyach, the empowerment to do mitzvahs. So therefore, not because of any greatness of our own, but because we are after the giving of the Torah, So we spend the whole year being ready to experience a revelation. And so therefore, it's a greater revelation. Just in general, the more preparation, the more, well, I shouldn't say more, the more revelation, because the revelation can happen independent of the recipient's capacity to receive it, but I should say the more preparation, the more integration. So, and you eat matzah, which is pretty integrated. You literally put it in you and it becomes your flesh and blood, which is part of the greatness of the mitzvah, is that you actually metabolize it. So we are, in, we are capable, not because of our own greatness, again, but we're capable of integrating a higher level of revelation. because we live after Matan Torah. V'al derech meilus ha-gilui de Chag HaShvuas z'man Matan Torah shela achre ha-avaydeh de Sfira Sa'omer al ha-gilui de Yitzis Mitzray. I'll give you a parallel that Rebbe says. You could compare this to the advantage of Shvuas which comes after Sfira. You spend 49 days counting Sfira. You build up to Shavuos, a lot of prep, a lot of prep. You're building up to Shavuos every day, counting, counting down, counting up, actually. So you compare that to the revelation that happened when they went out of Egypt. Compare Shavuos to Pesach. Shagili di Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, imi yeise gili, naila bi yeise bichvede v'atzmei, Yes, Pesach is an incredible revelation where we say Hashem Himself. He didn't send an emissary, but He Himself redeemed us. But it was unilaterally coming from above. Pesach is where we were helpless, literally helpless. We couldn't get out on our own. And He yanked us out unilaterally from above. And that's why it was only temporary. That's why it was only, the revelation was only temporary. But however, when we followed up that redemption with the count up, I'll call it the count up because it's not a countdown. Counting up, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, until we get a 49, and then we don't even count 50, we just be 50. Where we're actually doing our work. By the way, Nisan is Chesed and Ir is Gvura. So Nisan Chesed is flowing magnificently downward, and uh, Gvura is like the flame that rises upward. So you have Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, which is unilateral divine revelation, which because you don't prepare for it, you can't integrate it. And then Tzfir HaSoimer is where you step in and you do your work, you try to integrate it. from below to above, and so after we do all that prep, not only are we able to draw down 49 gates, you know about the, oh, remember from Purim, Al Kain Koru, the 50 Yamais uh, gallows, which we actually said was not a gallows, it was a giant impaling rod. But, um, yeah, remember Sharnon, the 50 gates of uh, Bina, of understanding, So we're able to not only get to 49, 
But after we achieve the 49 gates, Gam Sharanun, then the 50th gate is given. Like it says, count 50 days, 50 days, 50 gates. Within Sharnun itself, okay, hold on, I'm going to pause for a second because I'm going to get a little bit Kabbalistic. So before we get a little bit Kabbalistic, I just want to repeat what I'm saying. The Rebbe is contrasting the superiority of Shavuos over Pesach. Pesach is something Hashem did for you. Something that you, you were hopeless and helpless. You had no way of getting yourself out of that situation. In fact, if he had not redeemed us, like we say in the Gota, we still would be there. If you would give us a million years to get out of there by our own power, we could never get out. It was only going to end one way. Only if Hashem takes you out. Okay. So Pesach is very much about Hashem unilaterally above to below. Shvuas is after 49 days of you adding your work. Now you're polishing. Sfiris Ha'emer, Moloshin, Sapir, shining the, polishing the stone, cleaning up your character traits. So now you're doing work. When you put your work into it, ah, now we achieve a much higher revelation, the revelation of 50, which is Sharnun, and now I'll do the little Kabbalistic part. Uber <coughs> Sharnun Gufa, and within the 50th gate itself, in addition to the lower aspect of the 50th gate, which is connected to the previous 49, which corresponds to the level called Arech, also the higher aspect of Sharnun, which actually is higher than the 49, it's in, in its own category, Dugmas Atik, which is comparable to the level of Atik. Okay. We're talking about, yeah, yeah, you guys learned the, remember the poor mama, al Kain Karu? Yeah. yeah. And we spoke about how, uh, remember we spoke about there's this system which starts from Chochma on down. Chochma is the beginning of, say, the Rishtauslis, and then everything devolves from that. And then we said, but above, then there's above Chochma, which is called Kaser. Right. So in Kaser, there are actually two levels. Um, Arech and Atik. Arech is short, actually, it's, a two, it's Arech Anpin, the long face, which is Chitzenius HaKasser. It's often uh, corresponding, it's, it's described as corresponding to Ratzain, to will. We spoke about this in the poor Mimer. And then you have the higher level of Kasser, which is Atik. It's actually short for a two-name title, Atik Yoimin, Ancient of Days. And that is Panemius Kasser, which is often described as corresponding to Tainug, to, uh, to pleasure. And Atik also means separate or aloof, detached. So you have two aspects of Kasser. One which is above, but a source to all of Hishtauslis. That's Arich. And then another, which is completely a category unto itself, detached from and incomparable to all of Seder Ishtal's list, that's Atik. So the Rebbe says that if you do the 49-day 49, 49 processing of the unilateral revelation that Hashem gave you as a freebie on Pesach, but you do the 49 days of processing it and integrating it, putting in your own work, you know what that does for you when you're able to put in your own work? Then you achieve much higher levels than you did initially. You can achieve Sharnun, and then the Rebbe emphasizes, and not just regular Sharnun, but both aspects of Sharnun, even the higher aspect, which is Atik, which is way, way, way off the charts. Anyways, what, what, what the point is, the main takeaway here is, that the Rebbe is comparing Shavuos to Pesach for a reason. He's comparing Shavuos to Pesach to explain to us why it's possible that our matzah is categorically superior to the matzah that they ate even after midnight. Why? What makes it possible? Yeah, because of Matan Torah. So it's not us, but it's the fact that Hashem gave us the ability to respond to a commandment, 
when you respond to a commandment, now you are actually a participant. And it's not you're doing it of your own accord. It's not voluntary. It's not even something you did under divine inspiration. But you're doing it as a matzuva, as someone who's commanded. And all of that puts you in a place to be poised to receive a much greater revelation than if it just hit you cold out of nowhere. But weren't they commanded to be a part of the But, but what the, That's the, what the Matan Torah was a revelation, a revolution. It was a revelation as well, but it was a revolution. Matan Torah completely changed everything. Mitzvahs before Matan Torah, mitzvahs after Matan Torah are two totally different categories. We, I, I don't want to get into a whole discussion of it, but Matan Torah we describe as bitalagzeira that there was a law that Hashem put in place before, which was the spiritual and the material planes are separate aspects of reality. And with Matan Torah, it became possible to leverage all worlds, even the highest spiritual worlds, through physical actions down here. Okay. So, we are able, on Shavuos, to reach Sharnon, the 50th gate, and not just the 50th gate, but the higher aspect of it, which is which is uh, Atik. Shuhu Naila Yesa Gama Gilidi Yitzis Mitzrayim, which is even higher than the revelation that took place at the Exodus. And as we explained, the reason is because we participate for 49 days. V'yesh Lahaisif, and we can add even more. Again, this, this is the Rebbe suggesting his own novel insight. The advantage of the matzah that we eat, that us regular people eat, but we eat it with the advantage of eating it after matzah, the, the advantage of that matzah that we eat over the matzah even that they ate after midnight in Mitzrayim, or going out of Mitzrayim, is that what? He. In addition to what we already stated, that we're eating matzah after a year of doing actual ma- mitzvahs. Ella, but there's even something more than that. The, the eating the matzah itself is a mitzvah. It's not just that we did mitzvahs to get to this point, but that we're eating matzah as a mitzvah itself. Not a practical, incidental thing that happened like what we described. Why did they eat matzah? Because that's all they had. They were moving. They were rushing. Hashem suddenly revealed himself to them. They didn't have time. They didn't have time. It was just a practical thing. But we're eating it, not only with a year of preparation of doing mitzvahs, but when we eat it, it's a mitzvah. The matzah they ate post-midnight, which was their higher level matzah, that didn't even need guarding, was primarily matzah for practical reasons. As it stated, it didn't have time to rise. Didn't have time to rise. Mitzada gili delamayla, because there was this revelation that rushed them. It wasn't inherently a mitzvah. They weren't eating matzah because that was a mitzvah. They were eating matzah because that's what they had. Nothing was a mitzvah. Well, yeah, you could say that also. Nothing was really truly a mitzvah before Matan Okay, so even so. more so. So even more so. What we're saying is like this. They had two levels of spirituality, which we can break down in a timeline as before midnight and after midnight. And it's ascending higher levels of spirituality. We're saying when we eat matzah, which one of those two levels are we tapping into? So at first we said, oh, you know what, something cool? We eat it before midnight, but we're tapping into the post-midnight, the superior post-midnight level. Then later the Rebbe says, you know what, actually, 
even more than that. We're tapping into a whole other level that's higher than even the post-midnight matzah because their matzah that they ate, it was holy because of something Hashem was doing. Hashem is revealing himself to them. The, mitz, the, matzah, the matzah that we're eating is also holy because of something that Hashem is doing. Hashem gives us a mitzvah, but also because of something that we're doing. We're doing a mitzvah. So we have in it the best of both worlds. There's an aspect of our, not just of our matzah, but of our entire Yiddishkeit, which is able to reach to higher levels precisely because there's this participatory aspect of it. It's not something happening to us. It's something happening with us, or we're happening with it. Yitzhiya Mitzrayim happened to us. And when something holy happens to you, the levels that are capable of being integrated are limited. Yeah, but maybe when it's also for kids, you want to highlight and say love that Hashem has for their hearts and gives us to them. You're answering the question of why we describe it the way that we describe it. That's why we're highlighting it. Okay, yeah, okay, we'll, 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 we'll let's, let's deal with that later. What, then why do we describe it that way? But the, the point right here, at this juncture in the Mimer, is to appreciate this idea that the matzah that we're eating is actually greater than the matzah that they ate on the first Pesach. It sounds like the bug now is flowing both ways. <laughs> maybe, right? maybe, I don't have to think. Three midnight was just down to up, and then after was up to down, and now we're... <laughs> yeah, okay, you're wondering if that's, that's the vav. The vav is... Not just the, the hamshacha, but the halo, and it's going down and up. Isn't Could be. I, I don't know if it's flowing. Doesn't above mean a hook? Yeah, it's, yeah. Hook hook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. This, that's very memeable, by the way. Yeah, Hashem hooked us up. Okay. All right, let's finish off this chapter. The matzah that we eat after the giving of the Torah is connected with Avedis Ha'adam. Because it is itself, the eating of the matzah itself is a mitzvah. This is a very important concept. The fact that it's connected with Avedis Ha'adam, the work of a person, doesn't make it less, it makes it more. You would think, oh, it has a human element to it. Now it kind of taints it. No, no, no. The fact that there's a human element now. Now, obviously, <laughs> This is, is this is like a chicken and the egg thing if you don't know, if you don't understand how to actually source it and how to actually trace it. The power of the human element derives obviously in Hashem unilaterally, not only taking us out of Egypt, but giving the Torah. So it initiates it, it originates from him initiating. But once it's kicked in, once the cycle is set into motion, yeah, that human element becomes incredibly powerful and it magnifies the capacity of spiritual revelation. Because rather than it just being something unilaterally happening from above, now it's something that we're involved in and we're able to make it our own. In other words, let's put it in very simple terms. We have the capacity to be far more influenced by eating matzah than the people in Mitzrayim did. They're going to say, what? 
these are the people who they saw the ten plagues, they saw Moses, they were taken out of Egypt. And nevertheless, it's not about subjective experiences. It's not about who saw this or saw that. It's about the power of human participation. The power of human participation, which is made possible through divine empowerment, meaning the giving of the Torah. But what that means is that even though we didn't experience Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, at least not consciously in this incarnation, when we eat matzah, it has a much, or at least potentially, has a, has a much greater effect on us as people than it would on them. For them, it could be a, whatever. They, it's an experience. You eat it, it's over, you move on. For us, there's a real, at least potential for permanent change. That eating matzah can be a transformative experience. Remember, something that happens to you without your participation and without your readiness is rarely transformative. Simply for the fact that you can't integrate it. But something that you process, then it becomes you, and then that change becomes permanent, or at least to some extent it remains with you. So that's transformative. So eating that matzah, if you're not like your Matura mitzvahs, and you're not... Well, that's a superb question. That's a superb question. Everyone hears the question? Eating the matzah if you're not Shomer Torah Mitzvahs. Someone who is going to, someone who drove to the Seder and is going to be driving home. And they're going to drive home and, and tear open a, 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 a bag of pretzels. But they're doing the avoda of eating the matzah. So here's what I'm going to tell you that matzah is so powerful. If somebody told me, you've got a guy here who drove to the Seder, he's driving home, he's going to go home and tear open a bag of pretzels. You got him here for one minute at your Seder, and he's got to go. He's driving, he's got to go play racquetball. If I have one minute with him, you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to say a word, no speeches, no lofty Dvar Torah. I'm not going to try to inspire him. That's all subjective. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get a kazayas of Shmura Matzah into his belly. Why? Precisely for that reason. Because the matzah has that power. The matzah has that power. Yes, 100%. Okay, fine. That's the end of chapter 2. Mitzah Shem will continue next week.